Hey guys, this is Mel, and this is our last lecture in which I'm going to review some of the things out of your book that are going to be on the last exam. So we're going to kind of skip around on a few topics that I think might have been a little bit confusing. All of this pertains to climate change one way or the other. So one of the topics that they talked about in your book was this idea of a climate model. So a climate model is really a computer program, a very complicated one. And the way that we think about it is imagine if we took all of the ocean and broke it up into little cubes. And then we took the surface of the land and broke it up into little squares. And then we took all of the atmosphere and we broke those up into cubes. Now, we know all of the physics that goes on inside each one of these cubes in the atmosphere and inside each one of the cubes in the ocean and what the process is going on inside each square over the land. So for each cube in the atmosphere, for example, we know um, all the physics, all the thermodynamics, all the fluid dynamics, etc. that happens in each box. And so what we do is we make a computer program that does the math that occurs within each cube in the atmosphere and also each cube in the ocean and then calculates what's happening uh, between the squares on the continent and the cubes in the atmosphere. So it's doing exchange calculations. So here's an example. Uh, I would not expect you to know what any of this math means, but um, each cube of the atmosphere, uh, we can solve all these different things for each each single cube. Now, if we did this by hand, uh, if we had enough time, we could calculate all the conditions and all the physics that are going on inside one cube. But we're trying to do this for the whole atmosphere. So what we do is we break the atmosphere up into a, a bazillion little cubes. And then we have a really, really fast computer, generally one that has many processors. And we assign one processor to each cube. So, in other words, it's like each cube gets its own little computer uh, that's part of this big supercomputer. So, uh, let's skip that one here. The biggest computers, the fastest computers in the world, um, look something like this. And this, this one, uh, for, for a while, was the fastest computer in the world. It has not been that for, for some time now. It was called the Earth Simulator. And all it did was run what we call climate model. So you program in all of those equations for all those boxes in the atmosphere, in the ocean, in the land. And then you essentially, you know, a computer like this might have a couple hundred thousand processors and you sign a processor to each box and they're all solving these uh, equations simultaneously. So it takes a lot of computer power to do this. And so early computer models back in they actually started this in the 70s when computers were pretty slow. And then as the uh, computers got faster, our climate models got better. So one of the things that has made our climate models better is the size of the boxes has gotten smaller. So if you're trying to simulate the atmosphere, if you had giant boxes, like if you subdivided the, the Earth's atmosphere into like 12 giant boxes, that's not a very good simulation. Um, the smaller and smaller you make the boxes, the more realistic it becomes, but the more calculations are required and the faster computer you need to do this. And so as our computers have gotten faster, our climate models have gotten better. So here's an example of 1990s uh, uh, climate model. So each cube is 270 by 270 kilometers. Well, that's a pretty big box. And that's, a, that's the best they could do with the computers at the time. but there could be a lot of things going on inside that box in the atmosphere that you would not be able to simulate because your box is simply too big. So when this slide was made, it says present day, 135 by 135. Uh, today we have um, climate models that can do th uh, 30 kilometer by 30 kilometer boxes. And so today, with today's fastest supercomputers, we can simulate the atmosphere pretty well. Like we we our box the boxes are small enough and the math is tight enough that we do uh, pretty good simulations. So once you have a really good climate model that works, you can do different experiments with it. 
And this is there, you have a diagram like this in your book. So let me try to explain. This is a one of the IPCC diagrams. So let me try to explain what they're doing here. So imagine if you went back to say um, the early 1900s, and you said, "Okay, um, we're going to change history, and humans are not going to add any more greenhouse gases to the atmosphere." Okay. So what you would do in your climate model is you would go essentially back in time and say, what would the Earth's atmosphere look like today, modern times, if we went back to the early 1900s and we decided not to emit greenhouse gases? Like, what would have happened? And so the climate model cranks away at the math and all those cubes, and it spits out an answer. And then you can go back and say, okay, what would the climate uh, be like today if we did put in greenhouse gases and the computer cranks it out and cranks it out and spits out an answer and we can compare those two answers so this is kind of what they've done here so let's look at this uh, one here that says global okay so there's a blue envelope and the blue is kind of behind the pink here from here to here and then there's this pink and then there's this black line all right so they went back to the early 1900s they asked the supercomputer Let's take out greenhouse gases that humans have added, called anthropogenic uh, forcings. That's what they're calling it here. And let's just run this climate model and see what it does. And it spits out, now this on the y-axis, this is temperature anomaly. And here it says zero. So zero degree temperature anomaly means normal, right? So what it says is that cranks out to the year 2000 when this, this one was made. And it says that worldwide temperatures should have followed sort of this blue uh, envelope right here. Now, the reason it's not a single line is that there's multiple computer models that are run by multiple research groups on multiple computers, and they all give a slightly different answer, but the answers converge in this blue envelope here, okay? Or you could break it out by continent, like they did here in South America or Africa or whatever. Okay, so then they run it again. They say, all right, supercomputer, uh, Let's throw in some greenhouse gases and run it again and see what you get. So they do that again, and that's what this pink uh, envelope is here. Now you can see that the temperatures go up as we get close to the year 2000, or if we look at South America, or if we look at Africa, etc. So then, so the so the supercomputer is saying no green, no anthropogenic greenhouse gases, the human, the ones that humans make, no extra greenhouse gases. Temperature should have done what the blue is showing. With the greenhouse gases, temperatures would do what the pink is showing. The black is the temperatures we actually measured. So these are real life temperatures that people measured with thermometers over time. So what this is saying is the temperatures that we actually measured, the black line, correspond to the climate model outputs that predicted this amount of warming with those extra greenhouse gases. So the other way to think about it is that if humans did not do what we did, if we didn't burn fossil fuels, we didn't add greenhouse gases to the atmosphere, the temperatures on Earth should be following the blue. But instead, we, follow, we see that they're following the pink. Now, in a previous lecture, we went through some of the reasons why uh, you know, we eliminated, why uh, sunspots are not the source of global warming, why volcanoes are not the source of global warming. What this is, is this is sort of another piece of evidence that says, the math actually checks out that the extra greenhouse gases do provide the amount of extra warming that we notice. Now, for some reason, in the, in the in climate change world, the scientists use this term forcings. And you may have read that a bunch in your book. I don't like that term, but it's very popular. So forcing means you're going to add something to the atmosphere that's going to force the temperature to change. Okay, that's what it means. So if I add more CO2 to the atmosphere, that is a forcing. It's going to force the, the warming to occur. If I have more sunspots, that's another type of forcing. It's going to force the climate to change. So down here it says models only using natural forcings. What that means is naturally occurring things, sunspots, volcanoes, naturally occurring greenhouse gases. Models using both natural and anthropogenic forcings means Take all the volcanoes and sunspots and all that, and then also add the greenhouse gases that humans are putting in. That's what they mean. That's what forcings mean. It's I don't again. It's a word that I think is kind of confusing. So, recap here: 
the blue line computer model outputs without anthropogenic greenhouse gases, red computer model outputs with anthropogenic greenhouse gases, black is the observed temperature. So what we can say is it's very likely that the warming we're seeing is doing is due to anthropogenic greenhouse gases. Another way that we think about this is we've kind of eliminated all other possibilities, right? I mean, we talked in this class about sunspots and we talked about uh, volcanoes. Um, the Earth's orbit does change, but not nearly as fast as what to, to explain the warming that we have. So the only thing we're really left with are the greenhouse gases that we as humans have added to the atmosphere. And the computer math basically says, yeah, that looks like the most likely explanation. So the other thing that we can do with climate models is we can use them to try to predict the future. So once you have a really good simulation of the atmosphere, then you can ask it questions like, well, how is the, how's the climate going to be different, say, 100 years from now? So we've got the math down and we have the programming in the, in the software down, but there's still one big uncertainty. And the big uncertainty is we don't know what the future of greenhouse gas emissions is going to be. So there's a part of your book, early kind of part two uh, mostly, where it talks about how uh, there are these different scenarios that the IPCC has uh, put together. And they have these goofy uh, names like RCP 8.5 and RCP 6.0. And so what they did is they got together and they said, look, we don't know what the future is going to be like. But let's say what would happen if we continue on the current path we are right now, right? We're burning a certain amount of fossil fuels each year, a little bit more, each year a little bit more. And let's just imagine that keeps on going into the future. Or what would happen if the countries got together and they had some kind of treaty and they said, we're going to cut greenhouse gas emissions down, right? And so they come up with another uh, possible scenario, like maybe one, one of these. And so the best they can do is they come up with these different scenarios and they put them into the climate models and they calculate what the result would be if we went down these different paths. But we don't know what path we're going to go down. So that's what these uh, emissions pathways are all about. So in your book, so here I am on page 92. And so here's a graph that says global CO2 emissions in, in uh, gigatons of carbon per year. And, and this is time. So the black is our historical, uh, that's what we as humans have already done. How much CO2 we put into the atmosphere, how much carbon. And then here it breaks into yellow at the time that this graph was made. It was the year 2000. And they were doing projections into the future. So... You know, depending on what, you know, if the, if the economy continues to boom and there's no regulations, well, we might go up the red curve. And then if countries get together and decide, hey, we should, you know, save the earth, well, maybe that's going to be the blue curve and so forth. So these are the different scenarios and how the different projections play out into the future. Okay, so then they asked the supercomputers to, okay, well, if, if we did, say, the orange curve, what would the temperature of the Earth be like by the time we get to the year 2100, right? Okay, so a couple pages later, here's an example of what one of these looks like. So now the y-axis, so I'm on page 98. Global surface temperature change. All right, so up to here, this is uh, to 2000, looks like 2005, which is the time that they made this uh, particular graph. And... RCP 8.5, That's that was the red curve on the previous one. Now it's this red with the pink envelope around it saying, okay, if the world follows the red path of that RCP 8.5 in the, in, the, in the previous diagram, how will the temperature change? Well, it will change like this. That's what the computers are telling us. And the further out we go, uh, you can think of this as like, the, the red line is sort of the center, and this, this is the range of uncertainty around. And the more, uh, the, f the further out you go in the future, the more uncertainty you get in your prediction. But what they're saying is, if we follow the red path, the 8.5 path, um, then we will, we will see temperatures increase 
in this pink zone, which if you look across here is somewhere between three degrees and maybe five degrees centigrade um, above where it should be, which in, in uh, Fahrenheit is five and a half degrees and nine versus nine degrees and nine degrees Fahrenheit above what it should be. Whereas if we picked the blue one, all right, so this is the RCP 2.6. Now, what, what was that? That was the, okay, that's kind of the best case scenario. This is the one where we all get together as a, as a world and we say, we got to cut CO2 emissions and we actually make big measures, probably like this would be the best possible scenario. Like if we all got together and we started uh, cutting our fossil fuel consumption uh, a lot, well, then that is this curve. So it's going to, it predicts that temperatures will still going to increase a little bit because we already have so much CO2 in the atmosphere already, and they're going to kind of stabilize along this purple line. So the computer mo models, the climate models, are predicting that the climate's going to change somewhere between, you can think of this as like best case scenario and maybe worst case scenario, although it could be even a little bit worse than this, but realistically it's probably going to be between these two curves, which means that by the year 2100, we're expecting temperatures to be about one degree centigrade, which is or close to two degrees Fahrenheit warmer than normal, up to maybe five degrees centigrade or nine degrees Fahrenheit warmer than normal. So point being, our climate prediction models are only as good as the, uh, as the prediction that we can make to our greenhouse gas emissions. So what I've been doing in, the, uh, in my face-to-face -face classes is talk about some of the history behind some of the attempts that the, world, you know, that the world has seen to try to do something about greenhouse gases. So one of, the, one of the things that comes out of that modeling is that if we want greenhouse gases to kind of be flat and stop increasing, we actually have to start decreasing our greenhouse gas emissions uh, because there's so much greenhouse gas emissions that are already up into the atmosphere. So one of the, the big attempts was something called the Kyoto Protocol. And this was uh, adopted in 97. And then uh, countries started to follow it. And you think of it like a treaty, a bunch of countries getting together, signing a treaty to say, we're going to start lowering our CO2 emissions. And uh, originally had 192 countries, um, everybody signing on thinking about how they're going to cut greenhouse gases. But then in 2001, uh, the U.S. drops out and says, well, we're not signing on to this. Uh, and so we dropped out of this particular treaty. Um, and then more recently, there was another attempt called the Climus Parat uh, Paris Climate Accord. And they were trying to limit the future uh, temperature increases to about one and a half degrees centigrade, which again means you got to cut down those CO2 emissions. 195 countries signed on uh, as of 2015. And as soon as Trump got in office, that was kind of one of the first things he did is he said, we're out of the uh, Paris Climate Accord. And so now we've dropped out. So the problem with these treaties is it's kind of a volunteer thing. Countries get together, they sign on, but... No one's forcing you to stay, so the U.S. just left. Um, and, and the problem with that is, historically, the U.S. has been the number one contributor in greenhouse gas emissions. Now, today, we're actually number two. Um, China has taken the world as the number one CO2 emitter. Uh, now, if you add up a whole bunch of other countries together, you get a big chunk, too. But the, the three biggies are China, U.S., and the European Union and then followed, you know, by a bunch of other countries. So, you know, when we drop out, we're like a major, major contributor uh, to these, to the greenhouse gas emissions. And then once we drop out, then the other countries are saying, well, why are we going to do this if the U.S. is not going to do it? If you look at cumulative CO2 emissions in the past 150 years, so this is not the amount that we're emitting today. This is like all the CO2 we've emitted since, you know, late 1800s, uh, you see that the number one by far is the United States. Um, and then surprisingly, number two is Germany, and then number three is China. Okay, so historically, we've been the biggest emitter. And so when we drop out of these uh, treaties, it kind of looks bad for the United States. 
And then, of course, without going political, we have to talk about the current political climate, which is that we currently have an administration that thinks that global warming is uh, not even real. Uh, so this is a famous tweet from uh, Donald Trump. Um, Concept of global warming was created by and for the Chinese in order to make the U.S. manufacturing non-competitive. So he's famously has, has said that he thinks the, everything I've been telling you is, is a hoax that the Chinese government made up. Um, so with that and with the fact that we have um, the head of uh, the EPA, Scott Pruitt, also uh, is a firm non-believer in climate change, that it doesn't look like we're going to be signing on any CO2 treaties in the near future. So the reason I'm bringing this up is when we're trying to make these predictions, these types of curves, right now, based on the current political climate, we're headed up this curve, right? This is, this is the one we're headed up right now. Now, let's say in a couple years, uh, all the current administration is thrown out of office and a new group comes in and they say, you know what, we're all about solar energy, we're all about wind power, um, we're going we're gonna to tax the fossil fuels, whatever, you know, whatever the scenario is, maybe that'll suddenly shift us and we'll be on the, the blue path. And maybe we'll be on the blue path for four years and then they get kicked out of office and then another bunch of uh, fossil fuel proponents come in, then we're shifting back to the, to the to black curve again. So this is why it's so hard to predict, right? Over the last few, few years, we've been headed up the black curve. Maybe it'll change, maybe it won't. Or what if there's a big worldwide economic crash? So we had one in 2008, the amount of greenhouse gases started to go down because there was less manufacturing, because people were buying less, because we had less money. That could happen again, right? So, so it's really hard to predict the future. So this is why it's hard to predict uh, the climate change that's actually going to occur in the next, say, 100 years or so. So let's look at a couple examples of one of these climate model predictions. So the first one we're going to look at is RCP 2.6. All right, so from your book, this is the one where the countries, the whole world, gets together, realizes the error of their ways, and significantly restricts greenhouse gas emissions, right? I mean, it's really not realistic, but uh, let's just say that the CO2 emission curve looks like this. It goes down into the future until the year 2100. All right, what would the temperatures look like on Earth? So this is the, what we're going to look at here is the output of a model um, where we're, we are looking at uh, the globe of the Earth. And we're going to, you know, this one was run you know, almost 10 years ago, 2009, and it did a prediction is that if the world follows this RCP 2.6 emissions uh, curve, what do we get? And the colors tell us the temperature change, in, in this case it's in Fahrenheit, uh, in the future. Okay, so we'll play this. And so as the years go by here, you can see that most of the warming is occurring in the northern hemisphere and over the continents, which is what we've seen before. And I'm going to stop it when we get to the year 2100. Oop, a little late. So if I go back a little bit there. So most of the warming is occurring up near the Arctic, right? And, and if you think back a few lectures when we looked at the maps of current warming, the warming that we've seen in the last 100 years, we see the most warming up here. And what this model is saying is that in the future, that's going to continue. Now remember, this is like an unrealistic best case scenario that the all, you know, all the countries get together, big kumbaya, we're going to save the world, we're going to cut CO2 emissions, and yet still we see temperature increases uh, up here kind of around the 7 to 10 degree Fahrenheit uh, mark. So that means 7 to 10 degrees Fahrenheit above what it's supposed to be. Okay. So now, let's compare that to another one of the curves. Okay, so let's compare that. So we just saw the result, uh, the model output of this future, RCP 2.6. Let's go to the other extreme. Let's look at the 8.5, which in a previous slide was the black curve, and in your book it's red. 
But this is the scenario that basically we're currently on, right? We're headed up this red curve if nothing else changes. All right, so we're going to play another one of those movies, and it's just like the previous one, except now we have different emission scenario. So first, the pattern looks pretty similar. We're seeing more warming over the continents than the oceans, more warming over the northern uh, hemisphere than the rest. But notice how much redder these colors are, right? How much darker they are. So I'm going to try to pause this one. And notice the reddest part up here in the Arctic, that's 25 degrees Fahrenheit above normal. And this is the thing that you've got to keep in mind when we do climate uh, predictions, climate model predictions in the future. It's always given as a global. So in other words, people say, well, the Earth is going to warm by 2 degrees or 3 degrees. And you think, what's 2 or 3 degrees? Who cares? But that's a global average. And remember that a lot of the Earth, like out in the ocean and along the equator, is not changing that much. But in this scenario, the, the, again, the 8.5 scenario, um, you've got areas up here in the Arctic that have increased by 25 degrees Fahrenheit above average. So that's huge. And we also see big increases over land masses in the Northern Hemisphere too, right? So up here in Northern Siberia, you know, increases of, you know, 20 degrees Fahrenheit. So these are crazy numbers. So the patterns that the uh, climate models are showing are the same kinds of patterns that we've been seeing in the previous maps of climate change today. More climate warming in the, in the northern hemisphere and more over the continents than the oceans. It's just kind of a matter of degree, right? So this scenario here, the 8.5 scenario, again, that's business, what they call business as usual. It's sort of the, the path that we're on is the one that has the, the most warming. The first one I showed you, which was the 2.6, that's like best case scenario. And there's still predicted to be some warming in the Northern Hemisphere and over the oceans. So a major misconception that people have about global warming on both sides, those that actually believe that it's happening and those that deny that it's happening or don't believe that it's happening, um, is as follows. So we talked about in the past lecture about the Rossby waves, right? So here what I'm looking at is I'm looking at temperatures at the 700 millibar level, which is about 10,000 feet above uh, sea level. And we talked about how there's a very distinct boundary between the warmish air and the much colder air, and that boundary is wavy. Those are the Rossby waves, and they move, right? Okay, so let's say I zoom. This is just from today. And if you remember back to we talked about uh, mid-latitude cyclones and fronts, what we were saying is that these two different air masses mix up together. So right now, you've got a blob of pretty cold air moving down south here. And you've got warm air that's moving up to the north, and here, and up in here. Okay, so let's think about what two, pe two different people might be experiencing right now. If you live here, you, you are experiencing below normal temperatures today, because this cold air from the north is coming down. If you live here, you are experiencing warmer temperatures than normal, because this warm air is moving up to the north. Right? So we got cold fronts and warm fronts. We talked about this in past lectures. If you didn't know anything about the weather and you lived right here, you might be thinking, oh, we're, we are above normal temperatures. And if you lived over here, you're below normal temperatures. And if you wanted to, you might try to attribute that to global warming or not. So in other words, the person that's ex right here might be saying, oh, this global warming, it's so warm today. Right? But the reason it's warm today has nothing to do with global warming. It's because they are in this warm air mass that's moving to the north. And these people here might be thinking, ah, global warming is a hoax because think, look how cold it is today. But it has nothing to do with global warming or not. It's just that they are in this pool of cold air sinking down from the, from the north. This is what happens over and over in the discussion about global warming. 
every day around the world, there are places that are below average temperature and there are places that are above average temperature. It all it happens all the time. And if we look around the, you know, if I look just what's happening today, here's a place where there's cold air coming down, warm air going up. So again, if you lived over here, you are below average temperatures. If you lived here, you're above average, right? If I go over here, here's another one. This is a blob of cold air, they're below average. This right here is above average. Over here, these guys are above average. These guys are below average. So normally when you go around the world, you see a bunch of zones that are above average and you see a bunch of zones that are below average and they even out. Like mathematically, all of this should kind of equal itself out and you should have an earth that's just average. With global warming, what we're talking about is that average is very slowly creeping up and up. But I bring this up because it comes up in the news a lot where people will say, oh, it's so hot today, it's that global warming. No, that's not what global warming means. It's not a day-to-day -day thing that you can recognize. It's a long-term trend. Or politicians will say, oh, it's cold and it's snowing out here and it's May. Global warming must be a hoax. No. You're mixing up two different air masses. It has nothing to do with global warming. So people that are both believe in it and that people that don't believe in it still use this erroneously as an argument on either side. So one way to think about global warming is to think about a bell curve. Most places where you live on Earth, especially once you get away from the equator and you're up in, in higher latitudes, is that for any particular place, we have a number of days you know, we've got a, f a few hot, super hot days, we've got a few super cold days, and everything else kind of fits into a bell curve. Um, and the bell curve might be extra fat, it might be extra narrow, it just depends on the climate of where you live. But the point is, most of our days kind of fall in here with a few extremes over here and a few extremes over here. So I'm gonna draw a, a little line here to represent hot outliers and cold outliers, right? So, so this zone right here, you might consider this like your uh, heat waves, right? These are your your really hot events where you know some people die from exposure to heat, uh, makes the news, etc. Okay, so you expect that there's. There's going to be a few maybe record-breaking cold events, a few record-breaking hot events, but most days are kind of in the middle. Now, let's say I shift the climate just a couple of degrees, right? So the Earth gets warmer three degrees. What's the big deal? Three degrees, it might be warmer three degrees tomorrow, might be colder three degrees tomorrow. Nobody knows the difference. Who cares? What that really means, first of all, it's a global average. So as we saw in the previous uh, section, uh, Parts of the Earth are going to get much, much, much warmer than that, that three degrees, whereas a lot of it, maybe around the equator, doesn't change at all. But let's just say for this particular location, I increase the temperature three degrees. What that means is that this whole curve is being shifted over three degrees. Okay, so I'm going to redraw this as a dotted line now, where it's been shifted over. Okay, so this right here, that's our three degree increase. Okay, so we've shifted the average over three degrees. What does that do to these extremes, though, these tails? Notice what happens to our tail of cold events. On this new dashed line, we basically don't have them anymore. We were losing those cold events, the record-breaking cold events. When you did your climate change assignment, where you, you went and you looked, one of the things that we saw when we go back like 100 years is that starting like in the 90s, we start losing those colder winters, right? Well, this is, this is why. Now, the other thing that happens is how many of these hot events do we now have? So if I shifted this curve over, I now have a much broader area of these hot events. So by just shifting this over a little bit, 
I increase the area under the curve for this tail, and I decrease the area under the curve for this tail. So as humans, what this means is, we get a lot more of these dangerous hot events, a lot more of these heat waves. So this is why it's a little deceptive when people say, temperatures increases three degrees Fahrenheit, natural reaction is big deal, but it's the whole average that's shifting three degrees. And it's this tail that we worry about, because now we've got more of these hot events than we used to have. So we can already see the consequence of these additional heat events around the world. And one thing to keep in mind when we talk about uh, climate change is that the people who are the most affected are not us here in the United States. I and mean, we have this, we're kind of spoiled with our infrastructure, right? If, so if it's extra hot, we can just turn our air conditioners on, but a lot of the world can't do that. And it's kind of astonishing how many people die from these extreme heat events. So these slides I want to show you are just some stories from um, 2015, and I could update them and give you some more stories for this year, but these are the slides that I had. And so, for example, in 2015, you know, a heat wave in India kills over 2,000 people, right? Like, that's nuts. We would never see something like that here in the U.S. Uh, Pakistan heat wave that same year uh, kills 1,200 people. Um, you know, we didn't get into heat index in this country or in this class, uh, but if you have high relative humidities and you add to that high temperatures, you can produce, um, you know, it feels like it's hotter than it really is, and we call that heat index. So uh, that year, uh, Iran hit 163 degrees uh, heat index. So what that means is it, it felt like it was 163 degrees outside. So that was a combination of the high temperatures and high humidity that they had. Heat wave hit Europe. People died again, but not in the numbers that we saw in some of those other countries. Hits Japan. Um, when this story was run, 55 people died. Eventually that would become 90. So heat waves are, you know, have real world consequences and, and thousands of people actually die from these uh, each year. Um, also, another consequence of climate change <clears throat> is that you're getting flooding in places that aren't used to it. You're also, to be fair, getting droughts in place that aren't, places that aren't used to it. As we kind of briefly talked about in the past, we're shifting weather patterns around a little bit as we change the climate. And so there's human consequences uh, for these flooding events where, uh, you know, millions of people are having to leave their homes and there are death tolls in the, in the hundreds uh, often where these places flood. And again, we're not really used to this. I mean, how far back do you have to go to find uh, you know, 100 people in the United States die from a flood. doesn't happen very often, but in other parts of the world, they're not nearly as lucky. Also, getting flooding in places that you'd never expect much rain at all. So, again, this is the, all these stories were th from 2015, and in e Egypt, uh, Alexandria. So, the caption says, uh, Alexandria would usually only expect to see 5 millimeters of rain, during the entire month, right? In this one event, they got, you know, the equivalent of several inches of rain uh, that flooded this area, so many centimeters of rain. Now, we saw this image once before, which uh, is a record of number of hours of flooding per year in a neighborhood near the coast, and we talked about how this is partly due to rising sea levels. Um, you know, there are several places in the world where the land is pretty close to, to sea level. Bangladesh is one of them. And uh, we expect that 17% of the land mass of Bangladesh will be underwater in the next 40 years. And that's going to displace 18 million people. All right, so this is a country that's, you know, it's built on a delta. It's very flat, very near sea level. So the sea goes up just a little bit, it floods. Uh, a very broad area. 40, I mean, 18 million people, that's a lot of people that are going to have to go somewhere. This woman is standing where her house used to be before it got washed away. Another consequence of climate change, and by the way, we're just going through, you know, these are things that are in your book, uh, that your book talks about in, in like the first half of your book or whatever. Uh, more wildfires, so the warmer you uh, make the earth, 
the lower the relative humidity, the lower the relative humidity, the more chance of, of fires. And so again, this is, I went through this, uh, these slides, this one particular year, 2015, and just got all the stories about the record-breaking wildfires. And I could do this the year after, the year after, the year after, and you still get the same stories. So this on this particular uh, year, we had record-breaking wildfires, burning 8 million acres. Uh, Northwest wildfire fires, northwestern U.S., that is, uh, break records for size and cost. Australians battle the worst uh, bushfires for uh, the last 30 years. And so, again, pretty much every year it's the same cycle of news stories that are coming out. Uh, here's kind of a strange um, graph. It's, this is from Australia, and it says, Number of days hotter than 99% of all days ever recorded, right? So if you go back to the 40s, right, so like this year right here, I don't know what that is, 1936, uh, they had five days that year that were hotter than 99% of all days ever recorded. And then compare, and again, remember, long-term changes is what we're looking for in for climate change. There's, you know, years that are clearly hotter and years that are clearly colder, but the overall trend is that they're seeing more and more of these years where they have more and more record-breaking hot days, right? So this last one on this graph, you know, it looks like they got about 27 days that were hotter than 99% of all days ever recorded. So sometimes people use this term extreme weather. I don't like that term because who knows exactly what you consider extreme, but I know this gets in the news a lot, and I think your book refers to it, so I throw this in here. Um, the number of extreme weather events has been going up and up. This is, again, usually attributed to climate change, but it's a little fuzzy as to exactly what's going on here and what counts as extreme weather. So I don't really like to get into that too much, but I thought I would throw that in there. So a more important idea is the threats to agriculture and uh, the world's food supply. And one of the things we've got to realize here is that here in the United States, we've got this factory farming system where we're making more food than we can use and we export a lot of it, but a lot of the world uh, does not have that. And in fact, the, the farmers that are going to experience you know, the worst consequences from climate change are the little farmers. So here's a story. It says, small farmers in Africa will experience the worst of climate change. Uh, small holders with less than five acres produce much of the world world's food. And, and so when you have a shifting, uh, you know, shifting precipitation patterns, or it's now it's getting more, more of these warm events, you're going to see a lot of, of crop failure uh, on a small scale. So in other words, here in the United States, if we go into a drought, well, we could drill a well, we could pump water, right? I mean, there's things that we can do, but a lot of the world can't do that. They don't have the infrastructure to do that. So so we're going to see a lot of crop failure in the places that can't afford it uh, the most. And it's worth pointing out that the world is not necessarily getting as much to eat as they would like. And this is, again, something that we don't think about a lot in our country. Uh, this is a map of hunger. So white means you got plenty to eat, no problem. Uh, the dark green means that maybe there's a few, uh, you know, maybe 5% or so or less of the population that's uh, not getting enough to eat. And then as you start to get into these other colors, you start to get like into the red where over 20% of the population is basically starving. And you, so you see a lot of hunger, say, in Central Africa. Well, we just said that that's the part of the world that's going to be the, you know, the most at danger, most at risk uh, for crop failure as climate change starts to set in. So you're taking a, an area of the world that's already hurting for a food supply and you're going to make it worse once you start changing precipitation patterns and adding these additional heat events. Um, number six on our list would be threats to livelihood. And so we saw in those previous um, climate, anima climate change animations that the predictions that the northern, you know, up in the Arctic, that that part is going to be affected the most, most of all, uh, by future climate change, and it's already received the most, 
change up till now, and it's going to continue that way in the future. So there's a lot of cultures like the Inuit that their livelihood depends on the presence, say, of ice, and they're going to have to do something different because that ice is no longer going to be there. And we saw in that one uh, prediction that it was going to, you know, this area was going to increase by 25 degrees Fahrenheit uh, by, tw by the year 2100. So something's going to have to really change here in, in, the, in their livelihood in the future. Okay, last on our list of consequences of climate change are threats to ecosystems. And this uh, diagram was in your book, and it's kind of confusing. I want to go over this a little bit. So the idea is that groups of organisms can migrate. And part of this is common sense, that if you're a big animal and you need to move, you just get up and go. But other groups of organisms can also migrate at a much lower rate. So for example, trees can migrate. Now, how would they do that? Well, tree grows up, propagates seeds, the seeds then start a new tree, which then propagates seeds, which then start a new tree. And that forest as a whole could move in one direction or the other if it had to. And so if you look at a range on this graph of all trees, uh, the slowest trees could propagate, so on the y-axis it says maximum speed at which species can move in kilometers per decade, right? So this is 20, so right in the middle would be about 10. So this bar represents all trees in the world and the speediest trees looks like they could propagate at maybe 15 kilometers per decade. The slowest trees, maybe, I don't know, half a kilometer per decade, something like that. The black bar is what is the median, so you can think like that's where most trees are. So it looks like most trees might be able to propagate about a kilometer per decade, right? So if you've got a clump of trees and they've got to stay in a certain temperature range to survive, and then the climate is going to change, could the trees move fast enough to get to a cooler area to survive or any of these other organisms, right? So if you think of like a squirrel, so a squirrel could get up and, and go, except it has to stay within its habitat in order to survive, right? So let's say you got a clump of trees and surrounding the clump of trees is, I don't know, a prairie and for whatever reason, the squirrels have to live in the trees. Well, the squirrels cannot migrate any faster than the trees. So if the trees are slowly propagating in one direction, then the squirrels are propagating at the same uh, speed as the trees, right? They can't go any faster than the trees or they will run out of habitat. So let's imagine I have two clumps of trees here. I've got one clump that's on a pretty flat, um, you know, pretty flat ground. I got another clump that's near some uh, pretty um, steep terrain. So if I change the temperature, I make things warmer. So if these trees are going to survive, they need to get to a higher elevation. Okay. So these guys don't have to, maybe they only have to go up just a little bit, maybe to here to get to the cooler temperature and then they'll be fine. Right. So maybe this, this batch only has to migrate up to here, let's say, and they'll be in cooler temperatures and they'll be fine. This group has to go up, you know, to, to get this change in elevation, let's say it's a centimeter on my map, maybe that means that this group has got to get up to about here to be the same distance, you know, that same increase in elevation to get to here so that they can survive. But of course, this is a very long area for them to migrate. So the point is, is if you have a group of organisms or a forest that's on flat land, they're going to have to travel a much longer distance to get to a cooler temperature than if you had a group of organisms that was say on the side of a hill. These guys don't have to go very far to get to higher to to get to higher elevation for the cooler temperatures. This group's got to go much farther to get to an equivalent uh, elevation gain. Okay, so with that idea, let's go back to this graph. So we're going back to these RCP predictions, right? The scenarios, the emission scenarios. So if I had a RCP 2.6, remember that's the best possible scenario, that's this, in your book it's the purple one, 
on here, what it says is if we had RCP 2.6, it says flat areas and global average. Uh, this is the rate at which the Earth is, is going to warm. And what we see is pretty much uh, most of the organisms on this graph can migrate faster than that. So that's good news. The Earth is going to warm a little bit, but most, most organisms, including those on flat areas, will be able to go faster than the warming and will survive. But let's say we have RCP 6.0. So back on here, RCP 6.0, that is the orange one, okay? And so this is not as extreme as the sort of business as usual scenario 8.5. It's somewhere in between. So let's just say that this is the future. RCP 6.0, that's the emission scenario that happens and the Earth warms up accordingly. And so what this is saying it says RCP 6.0 global average. This is the rate at which the uh, Earth will warm. And organisms that are uh, below this line will not be able to move fast enough to escape the warming. Organisms that are above this line will be able to go fast enough to get to, to cooler areas. So of all the trees in the world, the trees that fall up in this zone will be able to uh, accelerate fast enough to go be you know to get to higher elevations to cooler temperatures the the trees that are below this all the species below here uh, won't be able to do that and will probably go extinct uh, up here says RCP 6.0 flat areas so any organisms that are stuck out in the in the flat areas um, they're they're in trouble because they're not going to be able to accelerate the the warming fast enough so all these guys would go extinct in that scenario if they were stuck out in the flat in the flat areas. These types of organisms would be okay because they could uh, conceivably move faster uh, than this amount of warming. Or if you go to the 8.5, remember the 8.5, that's the worst case scenario. That's the business as usual. That's the one we're probably on right now. Um, so we move from this line to this line. So again, any organisms that fall below this red line uh, means that they're not going to be able to move fast enough to outpace the warming. And then here's the flat area. So any organisms that's out on the flat area below this line uh, will not survive. So that's, I think that's kind of a confusing diagram to, to, to uh, explain this. But all you got to know here is that different groups of organisms can migrate at different speeds. Sometimes it's just the speed of the organism itself. It can just pick up and walk off. Sometimes it's the speed of the habitat in which the organism lives. So again, if you're a squirrel and you live in the trees, you can only migrate as fast as the trees, the forest itself is migrating. And in these different emission scenarios, the Earth is going to warm at different rates. And so the question is, as a group of organisms, can you outpace the warming and get to a cooler area in time? If you live near a hill, high elevation, it doesn't take as long to get to, to, a, to a cooler spot. If you live where it's flat, you got a long, long ways to go to finally get to, say, a higher latitude or something. You have a much, much lower chance of surviving. There's one graph on your book on page 50 that is pretty important, but I don't think they quite point out how important it is. So what it's showing is it's showing global average temperatures back to 20,000 BC and you see that they rise up. We're coming out of an ice age. And then, and by the way, the ice age was due to changes in the Earth's orbit, right? But that happens uh, very slowly. Uh, and then there's this thing that says the Holocene maximum. And you see it kind of dive down a little bit. And all of a sudden it takes off. And this is, uh, you know, the, the, the trajectory that we're on. Okay, so the point of this is that the amount of warming that we're seeing right now is very rapid compared to what we've seen in the past. But I want to talk about this part of the graph. And in, in, I'm going to show you a different version of this. And this is the graph that uh, I generally show my class. And there's some confusing things here, so let's just simplify. On the y-axis, think of this as temperature. Okay, something called delta O18. And it's something that's chemically uh, removed from uh, shells to reconstruct temperatures. Just not worry about that. Point is, if you go back um, 
These are, uh, this is 100,000 years ago, right? 80,000 years ago. We see some pretty crazy changes in the Earth's climate, right? We've got warm periods, we've got cold periods, we've got back to warm periods. So what you might say is that we're kind of in these, you know, ice ages or uh, in between ice ages. And there's a lot of craziness, right? A lot of wild swings in the Earth's, or in the Earth's climate. And we don't necessarily all agree on what's causing these big swings in the in Earth's climate. Some of its orbit, some of it may not be. But here's the strange thing. About 10,000 years ago, the climate suddenly gets really calm and it gets and it turns flat, okay? And we are living at the end of this flat zone. Now, as humans, uh, we need agriculture to survive. And it turns out that the beginning of agriculture was about 10,000 years ago. And there's a hypothesis that humans could not develop agriculture until the climate kind of settled down. So we went, so the earth goes through this pretty crazy period and then for whatever reason tends to calm down. And again, climate scientists are not 100% certain why, why this actually happened. Why did we go cr from crazy town to this kind of nice, calm period. But here's the fear. The fear is, as we talked about in the previous lecture about greenhouse gases, that we've suddenly just injected a ton of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere that aren't supposed to be there. And we've put more greenhouse gases into the atmosphere now than the Earth has seen in the last million years. So the analogy is often that we're poking a sleeping bear, right? The atmosphere was going along just fine. Climate was nice and kind of flat, no crazy stuff. And then the humans come along and they start adding all this CO2 and other greenhouse gases. And one of the big, big questions that we have as climate scientists, and the public doesn't really ever, this is really never discussed, is we don't know what's keeping the climate that constant over the past 10,000 years. And we especially don't know how it's going to react to all of this extra greenhouse gases. When we poke the bear, what is going to happen? And it's quite possible that the climate system could return to crazy town over here again. And we just don't know. In our climate models that we've, we've been talking about, we, you know, in all, all the tools that we have as climate scientists, there's still a level of uncertainty of what is actually going to happen in the future. It's pretty easy to predict that things will get warmer. What we don't know is whether things will come crashing down soon after, like it did in the past. So, the biggest fear about climate change, and again, this is not really something that most people, you know, the, the public doesn't know about this too much. It's not really in the news. It's not even that much in your book. Is that we don't know how long this calm period, this last 10,000 year long calm period, we don't know how long this is going to last. And we don't know what is going to happen after that. But we're pretty sure that if we keep adding greenhouse gases to the atmosphere, that something is probably going to change. We just don't know how it's going to change. So I've talked from time to time about how climate change is very politicized. And I thought I'd end this class talking a little bit more about that because you may not realize quite what's what's been going on. So uh, I I work with a lot of teachers in New Mexico, like K through 12 teachers. And in K through 12, they're supposed to teach uh, weather and climate. That's part of the new science standards. And I work with some teachers to try to help them understand weather and climate better so that they can teach it. So this is a book that uh, many of my teachers have received in the mail, and it says, Why Scientists Disagree About Global Warming. So the title by itself is a huge lie because I'm a climate scientist. I've gone to many climate scientist meetings where there might be thousands of scientists present. Uh, nobody's disagreeing that global warming is happening. What we disagree about are the, are the minute details, especially like projections into the future. So by the year 2100, how much is, it, how much is the temperature going to change? That's where the disagreement lies. 
Or maybe when we look at paleo climate and we see shifts in the climate like 100,000 years ago, you know, we disagree about the reasons for that. No one's disagreeing about what's happening today. Okay, so the title is an outright lie. And you'll also see that this second sentence is, a, there's a little trickery afoot here. It says, the NIPCC report on scientific consensus. Remember the IPCC? We learned who they were. So this is the NIPCC, the not the IPCC. But this book was printed up by a conservative group and distributed to, they printed up over 100,000 of them. They tried to mail one to every teacher in the country. And the whole point is to uh, generate misinformation about climate change and to try to uh, produce doubt in the teachers that are actually supposed to be teaching the students about weather and climate. So this is an example of some of the um, misinformation that's going on. There's a lot of money in the fossil fuel industry that are trying to fight uh, the, the scientists that are trying to get the message out about climate change. This is one example. So other things that are going on, for example, um, they hired a lot of the same people that were represented uh, tobacco companies in the 1980s. So in the 1980s is kind of when uh, people finally realized that smoking was really bad for you. And they had all these scientists from the uh, tobacco companies uh, that were saying, no, no, smoking's fine for you, fine for you. And there was a lot of misinformation that was generated to try to convince people that maybe smoking really wasn't bad for you. A lot of those same people are actually now being hired to do this kind of work, trying to uh, refute climate uh, change research. You know, all of the lectures that you've watched here have been posted on YouTube. And usually I post one up and you know you guys watch it and maybe a few other people watch it and maybe there's a comment or two or usually there's no comments at all because, I mean, who cares, right? It's some guy and his cat talking about humidity. Nobody cares. But as soon as I put the word climate change in the lecture title, everything changed. And so a couple lectures ago, we ha I had a lecture up about the just kind of reviewing stuff out of your book and had the word climate change in the title. And all of a sudden, this army of trolls just came out of the, out of the woodwork and started making comments on my, uh, my lecture and all of my other videos and uh, started sending uh, harassing uh, emails, messages to me. And finally, I had to actually uh, uh, hide a lot of our videos from this class so that they couldn't comment on them. And then also, lay down, Rumi. And then um, also uh, prevent them from um, leaving comments. And it, just everything changed. Like as soon as I used, uh, as soon as I put in the words climate change or global warming, then all these people came out, this whole army of trolls came out to, to attack me and attack this class. So that's, that's the world we're currently living in. And maybe in a different administration that might change. Uh, I suspect that it probably won't change for a long time. But realize that this is, a, this is a topic that's highly politically charged. And there's a lot of money to try to convince you that global warming isn't real and that burning fossil fuels is not a problem. Rumi's getting irritated, so I guess we're done with this class. And thank you for, for listening and watching all these videos, and I hope you got something out of it. And I think we're done, Rumi. I think we're done.